right within the forecourt of Liverpool Street Station. Parked in front of the entrance stands a statue of five young children. Their expressions, pensive, confused, wonderstruck, are as immortalised in bronze as the teddy bear the youngest girl is carrying. This is a memorial to the 10,000 Jewish children that arrived in Britain seeking refuge from Nazi tyranny across Europe. The children were placed in homes, hostels, farms and boarding schools across the country and it was, and remains to this day, an unprecedented organised rescue effort to save as many children as possible from the horrors of Nazi actions towards European Jews. Taking place over nine months across 1938 to 1939, the Kinder Transport was an almost immediate response to the devastation of the events of Kristallnacht on November the 5th, 1938, across Germany. After announcing the policy of Kinder Transport, in which visa regulations were wavered for at-risk children in Central Europe, the then Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare, said he and the Home Office shall put no obstacle in the way of children coming here to show that we will be in the forefront among the nations of the world in giving relief to these suffering people. The first public monument to Oscar Wilde outside Ireland is indeed a conversation starter. A bust of the writer's head, made up of a mass of squiggly lines, emerges from a coffin-shaped base. His right hand grasps at his cigarette. Maggie Hambling, who created this intriguing work of art, which was installed in 1998, was chosen from a pool of applicants to construct a memorial to the late writer. But her work wasn't met with total fanfare. Though many appreciated the abstract depiction of the author, others were horrified by the memorial's whimsical appearance. The cigarette Wilde originally clutched in his hand caused concern too. People repeatedly pilfered this small part of the sculpture, which is why his hand now often grips nothing but air. This sculpture is meant to be touched. The green granite sarcophagus that Wilde's head and hand rest upon serves as a bench, inviting passers-by to take a seat and have their own conversations with the great playwright and poet. Here was a man who offended against the social mores of his day and paid a heavy price for displaying the love that dares not speak its name. This installation in Spittal Square makes direct reference to the successive waves of migrants who have arrived in spittal fields through the centuries, narrating humanity's continuing perseverance for survival and dignity. An authentic wooden fishing boat containing seven seated human figures in steel. This sculpture symbolises the universal struggle and suffering of millions of uprooted migrants around the world, the boat had been used to transport refugees from Turkey to Greece and was acquired by the artist after being abandoned on the Greek shore. Leaning forward in silence, the human forms convey feelings of expectation, vulnerability, resignation, witness to the unending hardships felt in their fight for survival throughout history. By memorialising their transience, the artist transforms these figures into monuments of dignity, representative of the whole of humanity. Bronze Woman 
is London's first statue of an African-Caribbean woman, and has since its installation been recognised as an ode to motherhood and the prominence of this ethnic minority. The statue sits at ten foot high and was installed in Stockwell Memorial Garden. It was based on the now famous poem of the same name by Cecile Nobrega, who lived in Stockwell until her death in 2013. With her poem, Nobrega was able to immortalise not only her own memory and legacy, but the memory of all women. Who can help but set you, bronze woman above? Who can help but cherish this monument of love? And find me a place in the sun, in the sea. On a rock near an isle in the Caribbean, there I will set her, honoured, free. Free to be kissed and petted by the wind, free to be washed with the brine of sweet and bitter memoirs, sin. Free to be stubborn and steadfast as night, dark is her destiny. Wrong her right. The year the statue was installed also marked the 60th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush ship to Britain and the 200th anniversary of the end of the transatlantic slave trade. For Africans living in the early 20th century Nyasaland, now Malawi, the simple act of wearing a hat in front of a white man was considered an act of dissent. The latest statue for the fourth plinth in London's Trafalgar Square is similarly subversive. Unlike nearly all of the 13 contemporary art commissions that had preceded it over the previous 20 years, this statue, Antelope, by Samson Kambalu, is, traditional in form, a figurative bronze sculpture of two men. One is the preacher and pan-Africanist John Chilembwe, who broke the rule on wearing hats at the opening of his new church in 1914, and died a year later after leading a revolt against British rule. The other, half the size, is an English missionary, John Chorley. The figure of Chilembwe defiantly wears his hat, gazing across to the statue of George IV on the opposite plinth, under whose rule the British Empire rose to power. There's drama here, a reckoning in the making. Brought home to the heart of what was once the British Empire, and set amongst all those forgettable statues to colonialist adventurers. It's a reckoning with history. The new British Library was constructed from 1982 to 1999, and this sculpture of the great mathematician and scientist Sir Isaac Newton, was installed in 1995. It's a colossal piece of art, weighing six tons, and it's displayed in the piazza outside the library. Isaac Newton's face is cast in the image of the artist. He's naked, bending forward, and measuring the universe with his dividers. Newton's body resembles a mechanical object, joined with bolts at the shoulders and elbows, the knees and ankles, like something that can be taken apart and put back together again. This statue symbolises a confluence of two cultures, religion and the arts on the one hand, and the sciences on the other, and illustrates how Isaac Newton changed our view of the world, indeed of the whole universe. The universe is governed by mathematical laws, beautiful in their precision. Like the discoveries of Copernicus and Galileo and many other scientists before Newton and afterwards, Newton's work 
challenged us to see our religious faith not as the enemy of the scientific method, but as its complement. As the UK government welcomed the Saudi Crown Prince on his first official visit to London in March 2018, the charity Save the Children unveiled a life-size statue of a Yemeni child outside Parliament. The statue was a reminder of the dangers that Yemeni children faced every day and the risks of British-made bombs fueling the violence. The charity also took the statue to iconic locations in London, including Tower Bridge, Camden Market, Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital, to reflect the types of places where children were regularly being bombed in Yemen, such as playgrounds, hospitals, schools and markets. Save the Children then called on the UK government to use its influence to help bring about a political solution to the conflict in Yemen. Since the bombing had begun three years earlier, the UK had approved £6 billion in arms sales to Saudi Arabia. British-made weapons were killing Yemeni children. Millions of them were trapped in a brutal cycle of starvation, disease and violence. Hospitals had been bombed. Shipments of food had been blocked. The country was being torn apart. Its health services were on the point of collapse. Families had been denied the chance to make a living and feed their children. Yemen had become the world's biggest humanitarian crisis, and it was entirely man-made. The current war in Ukraine has led to vast numbers of children fleeing their homeland, children being orphaned, and, it is reported now, children being abducted and removed to Russia for re-education. Our children are our greatest hope for the future of the world and have the right to live free from harm and hatred. <laughs>